welcome everyone for you know for many reasons we are grateful that you're joining us um but i did like i said i peeked at the registration list and i saw that folks are joining from all over the world i saw uzbekistan and spain and um india and canada and of course a bunch of folks from within the us but yeah we definitely appreciate you carving out some time to join us uh so my name is kate heakin i'm an associate director here at williams i've been here for about five years uh love raising kids in the berkshires love working for this incredible institution you will see why over the next 40 minutes or so. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am joined by, uh, oh gosh, I was going to say a student, Lito. I am joined by a Williams alum who I adore and have gotten to know over the past couple of years. But Lito, I will let you introduce yourself. Sounds great. Um, good afternoon. Afternoon here, everyone. Um, as Kate mentioned, my name is Hippolito, but I just go by Lito. I use he, they pronouns, and I am a member of the class of 22. So I just graduated this uh, this summer, very excited to still just be here giving tours, to, talking to people through these virtual information sessions. So very happy to meet everyone. Uh, a little bit about me, I am a uh, Japanese major with a concentration in Latino Latino studies. I am from Panorama City, California. So um, as I mentioned from, from the Los Angeles area in the United States. And uh, in terms of my activities and involvement while I was a student, I was very involved with a lot of our identity groups, diversity groups. So part of VISTA, our Latinx student organization, part of uh, the Queer Student Union, as well as uh, the Coalition for Immigrant Student Advancement. So uh, beyond that, also a little bit of music here and there through Gospel Choir and Vive, one of our music groups here on campus. So nice to see all the people that are joining us today. Yes, thank you, Lido. Um, so I think most of you are used to this by now. Uh, when we are in a Zoom room, there are just some logistics we like to go over. So I'll do that really, really quickly. Uh, so you know your mics and cameras have been, you know, deactivated. Uh, but please, these are just these are not as fun um, if you don't send us questions. So of course, I have a couple canned questions I'm going to ask lead to at the end if there are zero questions, but that's very rare. So please use that Q&A feature on the bottom. Um, we're gonna present for about 20 minutes, uh, but then leave a lot of time uh, for that Q&A at the end. And of course, I'm knocking on my wood here. Um, I don't expect any technical glitches. We've got strong internet connection here. Um, but if anything happens, please try to rejoin. Um, and we apologize in advance if we if we miss you. Um, so, you know, I think if Lito and I had a goal for this session today, I would say um, that we really want to give you an overview of Williams. We know there are stats and facts that you can get on the web, but hearing, you know, from, from an alum, um, hearing from me, someone who, who does the work here in terms of traveling the world and um, meeting students who might be interested in Williams and then reading applications from those students. Um, we want to give you an overview of this place um, and really try to point out maybe what's unique about Williams, right? Um, and so we will definitely, we'll talk about the academic landscape here. We will talk about life outside the classroom. And then of course, we'll do um, at the end, some information about financial aid and the admission process. Um, so again, I encourage you to use that good old Q&A. Uh, but one thing we always do um, at the beginning of any information session um, these days is just give um, really proper acknowledgement to the beautiful land that we're on here in the Berkshires. That's what um, this area is called uh, in Western Massachusetts. Um, so we are on the, the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, and they are now called the Stockbridge Muncie community um, out in Wisconsin. We have a really incredible um, sort of budding partnership with them. Um, so if you want to hear more about that, learn more about that, certainly use um, our website and um, there's a, a dedicated page um, to that partnership there. Um, so again, we, we told you um, that, you know, you can find plenty of stats and facts on our website. I am not a presenter who is going to read to you all these slides verbatim. I could never stand that when my um, teachers or professors did that. So I'm going to let you take this in for for a few seconds. Um, but I think, you know, if I had to do sort of a main takeaway from this slide, I would say um, that you can see here, you know, our 2100 students come from all over the world um, to join this place that's really, you know, a pretty tight knit community. And then certainly, um, you know, we strive to look for students who are going to come and engage um, and collaborate and really push each other uh, to be welcoming. And so, um, 
one day I'm going to remember uh, to include in this slide a, a, a sort of a map of Massachusetts, because um, a lot of folks have heard of Boston, rightly to like, you know, major city in the US, Boston. Um, we are on the other side of the state. Uh, so Boston is um, on the eastern side of Massachusetts. We are all the way in the western corner, which is really cool because we're a couple minutes from New York State and a couple minutes from Vermont. So it's a really unique location. And like I said, a really beautiful spot. Um, so and I say this half jokingly, but uh, if you notice the zero there um, in the map in North Dakota, we're really tired of that zero there. So I don't know if anyone on the call is from North Dakota or has a lovely 17, 16 year old um, person that they know of in North Dakota, but you know, give them give them some info about Williams um, so we can get rid of that zero. Uh, so yeah, so let's let's start, um, I think in the appropriate place. Let's talk about the academic landscape here at Williams. Um, you know, like a lot of my colleagues here in the office, I did not attend Williams. Um, I cannot speak to it uh, as closely as, as Lito can. Um, I attended a, a much bigger university in Boston. Um, and I very clearly remember doing my homework and I was looking at a lot of the things that I think you all are looking at, right? How far is it from home? How big is this school? You know, sort of what are my chances with the acceptance rate? Um, and, you know, maybe like what are some of the major um, what are some of the majors uh, that, that I could study there? But I think um, in going through this slide, you know, you'll get some of that information, but also really understand how it works here in the classroom and through your years here. Um, so we're just, we're really lucky here at Williams to have a lot of resources and to be in a place where like collaboration is the norm. It's not this, you know, really competitive vibe here. Of course, students want to do well, right? But there's not this like um, sort of one-upping each other in the academic realm. Um, the curriculum is really flexible and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so much that so you can kind of see there on the bottom that um, more than 40% of our students double major. That's that's very, very unique. <laughs> I, you know, I, again, I went to this school in Boston and um, you know, was surrounded by very bright people as well, but that that was very, um, very uncommon. I actually didn't know anyone to double major. I think you would have had to be there four and a half to five years to to double major. So we're we're proud of that. Um, we really want students to explore. So yes, you can come into Williams right away and be like, oh, I, I know I want to do anthropology or I know I want to be a doctor, right? You can get going on those classes right away. But we actually um, don't allow students to declare their major until the end of their sophomore year. And believe me, this takes a ton of pressure off. Um, I switched my major three times um, and that was really just because I felt, um, you know, some kind of pressure from above to get going and just make this whole thing official. So again, you are allowed to get going on your academic passions, um, but it just, it takes, um, it takes a load off for students to know they have absolutely plenty of time to decide on that major or, or two. Um, so, you know, classes are small at Williams. I, I think that's, that's one of the first things that you'll find out if you start doing research about Williams, right? Um, and that really translates into crazy mentoring by your professors. Um, it is really uh, a place where we value those connections in the classroom. Um, but what I think is most interesting, and I talked about like doing my homework about colleges, I wish I had done a little more homework about, homework about how the curriculum worked, is what we do at Williams um, is, you know, we have some things that we ask students to take in terms of requirements. But I think we found this really sweet spot where we're not burdening students with tons of requirements, but we're also not an open curriculum school. Um, so what we do is if you look in the middle of this slide here, you see something called academic divisions, right? We dump every single class that's offered here at Williams into these three divisions. In my brain, they make sense to my brain, right? Arts and humanities, social sciences, and math and sciences. And what we say to students is we say, hey, by the time you graduate from Williams, just take three classes in each of those three divisions, knowing that, you know, whatever you're going to major in, that falls into one of those divisions. So you're all set there just by the nature of, of having declared, uh, you know, your major. Um, so again, this is something where students see it as, as somewhat of a framework, right? It's, it's nice when you come into college to kind of have some kind of foundation of what kind of classes to take, but we're not telling students you have to take this, 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 right? This long laundry list of, of classes that students have to take. Um, so Lito, you have done all of this. Um, you've done it successfully, right? You have graduated from Williams, um, taking care of these academic divisional requirements and, you know, choosing majors. How did you, how did you approach this? Was it scary? Yeah. Well, yes, it was scary at first. Um, 
I think I always think about uh, my very first semester uh, coming into Williams because I was choosing my classes that summer before coming. And I, you know, it, it is difficult because for some people, it's a big shift academically, you know, it's nice to have this freedom, but I know there's people who like that little bit of structure in their life. I think in my case, I had a similar situation where I wanted it to be a little bit similar to my high school, just because like I, it made me feel more comfortable and kind of use that as the starting ground for how it would go for the rest of uh, my academic time here at Williams. So my very first year, I said, I'm going to take uh, one class in each division, and then I'm going to have a leftover class. I'll figure out where to double up on a division. My first division one was my uh, Japanese class, which I eventually ended up majoring in. After that, I took a uh, political science class to do my division two, and then I took multivariable calculus for my division three. And um, I had a good balance. I thought I was like, this is material that I'm comfortable with. And I think that I can learn a lot in these classes. Uh, one more thing is because like I mentioned, I had one more class to take. Um, I went back to division one, took a class with the same professor who was teaching me Japanese. And I took a tutorial, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Um, but otherwise, I would just say that like to define my academic experience, like there's so much support. I think kind of as Kate had just mentioned, there's no competition over grades, things like that. People are very aware, you know, the fact that we're, um, a small school, so we try to support each other in many ways, be it, you know, you can ask people in your own class for help on things you have questions on, or you can ask, for example, um, you know, your professors, your TAs, if you have any, but there's just so many resources so that nothing ever feels like super overwhelming. Yeah, and Lee, I'm glad, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm glad for your honesty, because I think um, I don't care what kind of background you come from, or, you know, how rigorous or organized your high school was right that that first year academically is um yeah it's a lot it's a lot to figure out and um a lot of students put certain kinds of pressure on themselves so yes i think it is a little scary at the beginning um and but yeah i'm, I'm happy to hear you also say that you felt like there's plenty of supports here we really we we hope that's the case um so yeah again appreciate the honesty um so let's talk about our academic calendar and this lets lito talk about students Students' favorite time of year. I have obviously I live here, so I'm around um, the Berkshires every single winter, uh, winter study. Um, but I have not been able to do this very cool thing that we call winter study. So yeah, Lito, take it away. Yeah, I would love to. So um, as you can see on this slide, uh, Williams runs on a 414 calendars, and what that means is that uh, those fours are usually your fall semester, spring semester. You're taking four courses um, every time, but we have the one in the middle, which happens right after our winter break. You come back here for the month of January for three and a half weeks. We have this period of time called winter study. So for winter study, you're taking one class, not four. You're just taking one. And it's also a pass fail class, meaning that you're not really going to be like learning something super academic. You're not taking like a regular class. These are more so experiential. They want you to learn new skills or maybe learn like a little bit more about a specific subject, but not in a way that you know that you have to be super engaged. The classes meet for about uh, six to eight weeks, uh, six to eight hours per week. And um, there's a little bit of homework outside of that, but you have so many varieties uh, in terms of the courses that you can take. Uh, because they're not just taught by the professors. We have visiting professors. The staff here at the school is able to teach something if they're interested in. So you can do things like glass blowing. There's a little bit of a, um, there's a cooking class if you're interested in that. So we just have a great variety of options. Um, we do require that, for example, like our first year students, they have to spend their first semester here on campus taking a class. But after that, um, you still have to do something for winter study, but it doesn't have to be a class. I think students find that they have many, many other options. As you can see at the bottom of the slide, we have travel courses. Professors will take groups of 10 to 15 students to um, just go abroad to a different country, do a little bit of research, work on a project. It's a really fun time for everyone. If you wanna do an internship, which I actually did for my very last winter study, um, you can also do that. They, again, they just want you to be doing something that you want to do. And finally, there's the self-design classes where, for example, um, if there's something you yourself want to uh, study because you're super interested in it, you submit a request, you can get it approved, you can get funding for it, and they will say, okay, you have the three and a half weeks to do what you want to do, but you need to provide a final product. And that's true for basically all of these things. As long as you're doing something and you provide a final product that you know you did something and you learned from it, that's what we really ask for. But so after your first year, you're able to go into many other fields, but otherwise, everyone is required to do something for that period of time that we call winter study. And it's just really fun for students 
on campus because many of them experience winter for the first time, get to do so many fun activities. And I think for me, one of my, it's one of my favorite times here uh, at the school on campus. Yeah, I mean, just such, again, so much free time to really, really bond with your friends, right? I mean, very, very strong friendships are formed here. Um, and so, yeah, I think this this gets it, like the spirit of this place. I think it's like, here's a period of time where we want you to be learning and, you know, trying something new. Um, but we also want you to play. We want you to play outside in this beautiful place um, and spend time with um, with your friends. And so, yeah, I think it, it encapsulates sort of the Williams um, spirit really, really nicely. Um, so Lido, uh, you mentioned this earlier. Um, yeah, I would say when families hear about Williams, if they listen to an info session like this, they definitely walk away remembering two things. One is winter study, which we just talked about. And two is definitely this, this really awesome kind of class that we offer called the Williams tutorial. And it's literally what it says on the top. It is just one professor and two students in a class for an entire semester. Um, and so if, if Lito and I describe this thing for the next like two to three minutes and you're like, oh my gosh, no, I, you know, I, I cannot ever take a class like that. That's okay, you don't have to, they're not mandatory. Um, but you can see the stat there, many, many students decide um, they've heard so much about this Williams tutorial, they need to give it a shot and they, and they do try, um, do try one. So I, um, I will sort of explain the structure, um, but then I, I mostly want you to listen to Lito because he took one. Um, so when the course catalog comes out for like the next semester, students get really excited, right? They hop on their laptops, they look at, oh my gosh, what can I take, right? And they come up with this ideal wish list of classes. And we very clearly mark these tutorials because we want students to know what they're getting themselves into and not, not in a bad way, but it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and so, Often, uh, this is not 100% of the time, but often what happens is, you know, you show up to the first class of the tutorial and um, it's, it has to be an even number of students sitting in the room. Um, it is more than two students sitting in the room. Um, and what will happen is the professor um, may have already sent out a questionnaire or may just, you know, try to start a conversation going in that first class meeting. Um, because what's gonna happen next is that professor is gonna go to their office and assign pairs. So that class will not meet again as a group, right? Because we promise you a tutorial is two students. Um, so, you know, as a professor, I might meet with Lito and um, Lito's, classmate on Mondays at four, uh, maybe this other pair I meet with every Wednesday at two, right? So I am, as a professor, leading a class. So of course, there's a syllabus. There's you know, readings I expect this two students to do. Um, but I'm not teaching it as a class of more than two. I'm meeting with these pairs of students once a week, usually in my office. This is a legit photo from a couple of years ago in this uh, professor's very, very cool office. Um, and what happens then is this inevitably really um, allows for students to take ownership of the course um, because there's this back and forth that happens every week. And Lito, I'll actually, I'll probably let you talk about that because you'll probably be able to explain it better than I can. Um, yeah, we give some examples on the bottom um, of this slide here because Tutorials are offered in all subjects. Some of the ones we describe are, are more humanities-based, but there are math tutorials, there are physics tutorials, dance tutorials, right? Um, but Lita, why don't you talk about like what this looks like, you know, when you're meeting as, as a threesome once a week? Yeah, for sure. So um, as I mentioned, my very first semester, I also took a tutorial with my same professor that was teaching me Japanese. Um, this one was called uh, Japanese language and culture. It was taught in English, but it was basically about the development of Japanese as a language, how it's been affected by other cultures, and just kind of like comparing what Japanese sounds like now as opposed to what it sounded like hundreds of years ago, 100 years ago. Um, and it was a very interesting course. So the very standard form of, form of tutorials that you get is you will get a syllabus for the topics with, uh, with the topics for all of the weeks that you're doing because you're only meeting once a week. And how the actual tutorial works is um, for the first week, let's say you, you have a partner, you will read everything, you and your partner, and you will write a five to seven page paper. The day before you meet for your tutorial, you submit that paper to the professor, but also you send it to your partner. And then your partner has that whole day to read your paper and then respond to it, um, be probably usually like a two to three page response. Um, the day after you meet together, all either in the professor's office, sometimes they'll take you all out for coffee. It's just like, it's very laid back, casual situation. Um, and you're just like talking about the papers, you know, you're having a discussion and the professor really just like takes a backseat during this time. Uh, their biggest role really is in like looking at your writing, 
uh, providing feedback, but during the discussion, it's very student-led. The students are the ones who just consume the material, they're having a conversation, they're learning from each other. And what the professor does by being there is that they can kind of bring this uh, conversation back if it ever deviates and they feel like they need to get back on track, or if they feel like there's any extra information that you know hasn't been included, they'll try to like introduce it to the conversation, but they'll let the students work with it. So it's a very independent kind of like learning situation, but it's very effective in many ways because since you're writing every single week, you're getting to become a better writer. You get the feedback every single time. So you know, you, like these are things that are consistent and I would like to work on more, or maybe this is good and I wanna do it more. Um, so you have a lot of ways to work around with it, which is really fun. Um, personally for me, I wasn't a great writer coming into college and this class was very effective in helping me develop that, uh, very happy for it. But um, that's not the only form of the class that is taught. You know, that is the most common, the paper writing back and forth, but we do offer tutorials in every academic field. We offer them designed also some of them for first year students. So you don't have to wait to take these classes. You can take them right away if you want. Um, other classes could look like you're making a music composition for a music tutorial. You're doing a problem set for a math or science one or writing or uh, composing a dance piece and like performing it or taking a video of it uh, for a dance tutorial. So there's many different options you can take. The paper writing one just happens to be the most common one because most of the classes just have room to do that more so. So yeah, it's really fun. You don't have to do it if you don't want to, but it's definitely there for you if you're interested in it. But it clearly, um, if more than half of students take at least one. And I think within that stat, the majority of them actually go back and take more. Yes. Yeah. Again, we we promised you, <laughs> we promised you the unique aspects of Williams. This is this is definitely really special. But I will give a shout out to Oxford University because we've borrowed this from them. This is how they teach all their courses. But yeah, definitely, um, definitely memorable and something to to think about. Um, so, you know, I know because I, again, I, you know, I travel this country a lot and, and talk to high school students and read applications. I know um, that research is on the minds of a lot of you. Um, you've been lucky enough to maybe use some summers to do research or maybe your high school is allowing you to do some. It's okay if you haven't, by the way. <laughs> um, but I know that, you know, it's on some um, students' radars for, for college. And so, you know, if you walk around this place, if you walked around Williams College, um, you know, what you will not see is this sort of large, intimidating research university. Um, what you will see is this beautiful um, college setting. And if you start talking to professors and students, I think you would be just like I was in my first couple of weeks when I started working here, absolutely amazed by the scope of the research that's happening here. So we're just very lucky in that there is no um, grad school here where students are going to compete with undergrads for those really, really coveted um, and really rewarding research uh, assistantships. So, Research can be done throughout the academic year here, um, but it is really robust every summer. So the first two things listed on this slide, summer science and, and class of 57, 57 summer research, um, those are the ways in which most of our students uh, stay here during the summer um, and participate in research. I said most, I meant many of our students. So um, at least 300 students uh, stay here on campus in free housing, um, being paid to do research every summer. So it's always paid, which is phenomenal. Um, so this is just, you know, this is an incredible opportunity to work really closely with a professor who obviously you've been excited about because you've probably just, you know, walked into their office and said, I'm really interested in what you're doing. You know, is there a way I could be involved or done an, an email to them? Um, so research is something that is, is fairly common here at Williams um, and again is very, very accessible. And so we want to, you know, point that out that liberal arts colleges are definitely places where um, if you're interested in research, it, you know, you should not strike them off the list um, because they are liberal arts colleges. I would, I would argue that you're going to actually get in there and do research earlier at many liberal arts colleges. Um, the three bottom things mentioned there, small is actually really ironically named because it's one of the largest, most prestigious um, math research programs in the country. It is hosted at Williams um, and 60, Studio 62 is a sort of in residence theater um, research position and students get to stay here and be involved in our theater festival and work with, you know, 
world renowned um, artists and master classes. Um, and again, these are all paid opportunities. And the last one is just a phenomenal summer opportunity to spend a few weeks in DC um, and do research, but also intern for a, you know, a think tank. Um, so again, just uh, putting research on your radar because it is, it is quite accessible here at Williams. Um, if you hadn't gathered it so far, um, Williams students are super curious um, and that extends to them wanting to, you know, see the world and see other cultures and listen to other languages. Um, here's the good news. I, you know, I don't care where you go to college or university in the future. This is fairly common um, that a college will offer this. I just think the unique things to point out here about Williams is that we've been doing this for a really, really long time. And so we have some very established partnerships and we even have one woman on campus, Tina, our Dean of International Education, who walks through and students through this process because it you know, can be a lot and there you know, are many deadlines and applications. And so um, this, you know, this Dean of International Education that we have really is helpful um, to make sure that students um, can take advantage of this kind of thing. And the other thing that we love to mention is that um, you know, we have a lot of resources and financial aid here at Williams applies to your time away or abroad. Um, and that is not something that all schools um, can offer. So again, we're really, we're really lucky. Um, so Lito, do you want to talk about the two really sort of special signature Williams study way, study broad programs programs? Yeah, I would love to. So, um, you can see them here on the slide. I can talk about them in order from top to bottom. The first one is, uh, the Williams Exeter program at Oxford, also known as WIPO. Um, it is where we borrowed the tutorials from as Kate had mentioned and how, WIPO works basically is this is a program you actually start applying to during your sophomore year. It's one of our like more competitive-ish programs because there is a hard limit on how many people can go. Um, it is 26 juniors that are allowed to go to Oxford University for a whole year. And what happens as part of that um, study abroad opportunity is that you just become a student at Oxford for a whole year. You have access to the whole academic you know, spectrum. You can take any classes in whatever field you're interested in. And it's uh, very nice because that's actually something that uh, Oxford students themselves don't actually get. They're usually locked into the department that they go and declare their major in. But as a Williams student, you're able to take a class in any sort of field. So you have a, a more varied schedule if you so choose to. Um, it's not only the academic part, you know, you're living with Williams students. There's a faculty member there with you. Uh, but you are fully integrated into the life at Oxford. You, get, you can join their clubs, their sports, all these other organizations. So you like really feel like you're a student there. At the end of the program, you know, you come back, but thankfully you still become part of the Oxford Alumni Network, um, which gives you access to two alumni networks once you graduate, both Williams and Oxford. So students who do this program, you know, tend to um, really enjoy it and appreciate the fact that they get a lot of benefits even after they left, even though they only did it for one year. And then the second one, um, Williams Mystic, it's part of the reason why we actually call the opportunity study away as opposed to study abroad, because some of our programs are domestic. This one happens in Mystic, Connecticut, not too far from here. And it's an interdisciplinary uh, maritime studies program. So you're doing a lot of environmental science work, maritime policy, maritime literature. Um, you're out there uh, in Mystic, Connecticut. You do a lot of other opportunities. Um, students really get the opportunity, for example, to learn uh, open sea sailing. They go on trips on these ships to conduct uh, field seminars, which are uh, really interesting. And I know that for this coming year, for the fall 2022, um, they've released some of the plans that they have. For example, they're going to go to Maine, to Alaska, along the Gulf of Mexico. So, you know, there's a lot of fun activities that you get to do as part of it. That one is only a semester long, and it's actually one of the ones that you can do um, as a junior, uh, as opposed to, uh, as, a, as a sophomore, as opposed to a junior. Uh, but again, most students do choose to just try it out for, um, for the great opportunity. You know, you don't have to be a major in a relevant field if you think it's interesting and you could think, and you think it, it could potentially um, help out with whatever you normally like to do. People do that pretty often. So it's obviously an amazing opportunity. And those are the two programs that, you know, Williams um, runs itself. Thank you, Lito. So yeah, so only three more slides um, before we get to your questions. I see some questions already in the Q&A, but 
please feel free to keep asking. Like nothing is too small. Ask us. Definitely. You can tell we're, we're honest. Um, so Lito, I have not lived in a Williams dorm. There are many different kinds and we guarantee housing for four years, which is great. I, I had to live off campus my junior year. I was kind of annoying. Um, but yeah, so tell us, tell us about the Williams entry, which is um, the first year sort of housing uh, system. And then what happens after that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you can see in this picture and at the title of the slide, uh, we have this system called uh, the entry system here at Williams. As part of your first year housing, your buildings are actually divided into different subsections composed of about 40 first year students, three to four junior advisors. The junior advisors, as the name suggests, are junior students. They've actually, you know, they've uh, considered their other opportunities of doing research, doing study abroad, but in the end, they want to live in the first year dorms and service advisors to make sure that the first year students are having a very safe, inclusive, fun first year experience. And um, as part of the entry, you know, it's carefully constructed. Uh, by the people who work in housing to make sure that you get a glimpse of the diversity we see here at Williams, uh, also call it a microcosm. And um, it really just brings together people from all over, all over meaning many different things, you know, all over the country, all over the world, from all different academic backgrounds and interests. You know, you'll have your fair share of athletes, musicians, artists, and it's just a really nice kind of like built in community when you first get here uh, to Williams. And, you know, it's very supportive. Um, it's there for you if you want it, uh, if you want it to be. I think Kate in a couple of things has mentioned, you know, nothing at Williams really is forced upon you. It's just like it, they will let you know this is here. And if you want to use it, it's obviously available. And a lot of students, you know, they do find that they like it, especially because of the activities that are um, performed as part of like community building. And that gets to the final point here, the Sunday snacks. So Sunday snacks, the way it works is uh, once a week, the junior advisors will give a couple of students a little bit of money to go buy snacks around the area, bring them back to the dorm, and then at around 8 to 10 p.m., depending on the entry, everyone gets together to just spend time together, you know, ask about how has your week gone, what are you looking forward to, if you are part of a performance group, a sport, things like that, great opportunity to invite new people to come to your games, to your performances, so obviously just an amazing time for people to come together, um, and you know, it works as a first year experience. It is sort of that springboard into social life at Williams in general, but you know, it's only there for one year. It's only there as part of your first year experience. And after you finish your first year, you get to go into the lottery system with up to six people, including yourself. Um, and you have a lot of different options in terms of the housing, you know, there's many traditional dorm kind of style housing. There's some that are just small houses, uh, apartment style houses. Uh, in the case of the last building that I lived in uh, prior to this summer, it was actually a renovated hotel. So like, you know, you get a lot of different variety, uh, a lot of variety in regards to just where you get to live. So it's very, uh, very much a nice situation. And because you get to go in with a group of up to six people, you know, you might, worst case scenario, you might not get the building you want, but they will guarantee that you live with the people that you want to live with to make sure that you're not just alone for your like following years after your first year. You are allowed to have your friends close to you and we try to make that happen um, as often as is possible. Awesome, thank you, Lito. Um, this is actually perfect because one of the questions in the chat is sort of about our alumni network and believe me, I could, I could spend, oh my gosh, a couple of slides on this, um, but we will restrict it to one. Uh, so, you know, I don't want any of you fast forwarding too much in life. I want you to sort of also enjoy the moment, right? And think about just the next step, but a lot of people, and, and by that I, I often do mean parents, want to know, you know, what, um, you know, what do students do with a liberal arts degree and what do they go on to do? Um, are they successful, right? Um, and how do you support them? Most importantly, how are you going to support my student or recent alum? Um, so I will just say, uh, if I could sum up a Williams alum um, in two words, it would probably be something like fiercely loyal. Um, so there is no shortage of purple and gold in these folks' <laughs> wardrobes um, and no shortage of this very intense need to to pay it forward with William students. So, you know, our alumni um, are often lucky enough to give back financially, but more often than that, um, they are reaching out to us and saying, um, I have this internship. I'd love to give it to a Williams student or a recent alum. I have um, this project that I'm working on. Or is there anyone who'd be interested? Or I am 
you know, such and such and in, in, in this field, in this discipline. And I really would love to to talk to anyone who's interested in, in this. And so, um, you know, if I could lend, you know, lend any pertinent information or a pathway to do what I'm doing, you know, they're just wanting to connect. And so we're, again, really fortunate. We also have the support of our 68 Center for Career Exploration. Every college has a career center, but I guarantee you not. Um, not too many are so adept at making sure um, students understand that you should use this career center all four years. So they are just on the ground all the time reminding students that they can come in person um, to get any kind of career or internship or grad school help. Um, but they're also um, always updating the ways in which they can interact with students online through different really cool platforms and again, ways to connect. Um, so you can see some stats and figures there that again, um, some folks consider impressive, but I I think, again, my takeaway here is that there are EFs, that's what we call ourselves, EFs all over the globe, um, who are doing some really incredible work uh, and really are interested in, um, in mentoring uh, current students. And so, you know, all of this to say it's, it's a network we're really proud of and are always hooking our students into. Um, so let's talk about, you know, what what some of you might be nervous about um, and what takes up the bulk of, of my time and what I do every winter and I love it. Um, you know, let's talk about the admission process here. So you're gonna see that H word holistic a lot if you attend liberal arts um, information sessions and it's it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> and I think we do really hear well here at Williams. So, you know, we do what's called a holistic review of the applications in front of us. And one cool thing is that every application of Williams is read by two people in our office um, and it is together even if it's a pandemic and we have to read together in a Zoom room. Um, but we're looking at your application together all of the pieces, you know, we're often looking up because we're almost at the same point in your essay and we're going, oh my gosh, are you on paragraph two? It's absolutely amazing, right? We're reading your teacher recommendations together. Um, so everything that you put forth um, in your application is looked at in this holistic way, meaning we're trying to get to know you, you know, as you can see there on the bottom, we don't do interviews, right? Um, we're not tracking how much um, you have interacted with us in this scary big brother way, right? We are looking at you in the context of what you present in your application. And so all of that is, um, is again, is painting a picture of who you are and where you come from. So it's this really cool community building exercise. Um, and we take two different kinds of applications. Most folks in the world apply to college using the Common App, but we have no preference. We love the QuestBridge app as well. Um, so, you know, you will probably get advice from your school counselor or you'll, you'll gravitate towards one of those. Um, and I make sure that we emphasize the deadlines part um, because there are many schools out there who have early action, um, but Williams is an early decision school. And so if you know if you are absolutely in love with Williams in the fall of your senior year and um, you decide that you're ready, you have everything ready to apply by November 15th, that is great. But just know that if you apply early decision and you get in, you must come to Williams because it's, it's what's called binding. It's a binding admission program. Um, but if you're not sure, that's okay. Plenty of time until regular decision. This next year, our, our um, deadline will be January 9th. We wanna give people a little bit of time over their winter break, right? Um, uh, so often schools do January 1st, but we try to be a little flexible and push it back a little bit into January. And we also um, welcome uh, applications from transfer students. Um, and more specifically, you know, really high achieving students from community colleges, um, veterans. Uh, so they have a whole separate timeline um, of March 1st application deadline. So um, I talked a little bit about demonstrated interest a minute ago. I just, I wanna circle back to that because um, I think it's good information for you as you start this process um, and go through the next um, couple of months or a year until you're a senior in high school. So there are schools who have to do what's called they have to track demonstrated interest. They want to know how much you've engaged with them because they're going to use that information in the admission um, decision process. So if you click on a website, if you open up a link um, in an email that you've gotten from a college, if you email their admission counselor, if you attend an event, all of that is, is going to be tracked um, and then again used um, to, to ascertain whether they might be able to yield you or not as a student. They wanna make sure they have a robust freshman class. Um, again, we want you to get to know Williams, don't get us wrong, right? There's nothing wrong with you emailing me if I'm your admissions officer, right? Or attending this online event, um, but I am not going to look at a page of that or a list of that 
at when I'm reviewing your application. I'm just going to, again, um, look at what you've presented to me, um, you know, what, what story you want to tell about yourself, not judging off of how much you've interacted with us. Lito, I always forget, did you applied early or regular? I can never remember. I always like to ask my tour guide. Uh, I applied early. Through That's right. Okay. That's right. Um, thank you. Thank you. So um, last but not least, um, you, if you were in person here over the past couple of months, you would probably see a lot of us doing a happy dance whenever we do an info session and get to this slide, because this is an announcement that we just made in April of this year, um, which was incredible for so many of our um, families and families to come. Uh, so what used to be on this slide on the right hand side was a pie chart, so a lovely colorful circle, and there were three pieces of the pie. Um, it was to represent the average financial aid package here, so in a pie form. Um, and those three slices were grants, meaning the big, big slice that you want to see. Most, um, most students here who are on financial aid um, have at least 94% of their package in, in grants. And then uh, work study and loans were the other two pieces of the pie. And so that's what used to be there. But um, in April, um, we made the announcement that we are going to be the first school to be um, all grant. And um, because that means what it says there on the left, um, that we'll no longer package any loans um, or require students to work during the summer um, or during the academic year. Um, so that is um, that is very unique. And we still do all these other very amazing things um, like cover, you know, summer storage. Lito, I'm sure, like, you know, not fun to have to haul a ton of stuff back and forth from the West Coast, you know, even one summer that would be expensive and annoying. Um, think about our international students, right? So we do things like that. We're always thinking of what's getting in students way, right? Summer storage, maybe health insurance we cover for students, music lessons, textbooks, lab supplies, right? These all add up. Um, and so we wanna make sure students understand um, that we're always thinking about those things. Those are part of your financial aid package. Um, but again, we made this big move to say no loans, um, no work study uh, moving forward. Um, on every, uh, every college and university website in the US, you will find this thing called a net price calculator, um, that image down there on the left. Um, it's, it's definitely questions that I think a student can't answer alone. A parent or guardian would need to help with all that really exciting tax information, but it's not too long and it, it does give an estimate of what it will cost to send your student to college um, for that next year. But we all love this shorter calculator on the right there um, that is not on all websites, but it is on ours. Um, and it's just six questions and again, gives a really good estimate. Um, so we encourage you to, you know, to do this planning and to do this thinking now. Um, it can sometimes get uncomfortable for families to talk about this, but it's, it's better to do it up front. Um, so we like to uh, put out all of the tools available. Um, so uh, let's let's definitely let's get to questions and I will do a shout out on the right hand side there. Um, gosh, bless you if you're not on social media, but I'm guessing most of you are. Um, and this is not like a sales pitch, but this is actually me saying if there are any colleges that you are really interested in right now, um, it would be wise of you to follow them on social media. Um, many times it is students who are curating what's posted um, or the stories that are put up. Um, and so you are, you are getting a, a pretty good sense um, of some, some places, what's important to them, what does it look like, what are they eating, right? What are they doing at night? Um, so, you know, again, ours, ours is great, um, but I, I encourage you to follow all of your favorite schools on, on social media just to get a better sense. Um, so Lito, I'm going to open up the Q&A, um, and I think we covered their sort of alumni network pretty well, um, as there was a question about that. Um, so Lito, there are some questions here about classes. I'm going to take the first one because um, it's easy to, to explain. So, you know, definitely at some large universities, you're really excited to meet your professors, and you've heard all about how you know, famous, incredible they are, but then all of a sudden, you know, lots of your classes are taught by TAs or teaching assistants or grad students. Is that a thing at Williams? Um, we have some really cool things called like language teaching assistants who are in the classroom and sometimes a student will serve as like a, a TA. Um, but no, we do not allow anyone except our full tenured professors um, to teach courses here at Williams. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's our approach on that. So Lito, in a tutorial, you know, it might be scary to think like, oh my gosh, it's just me and one other, other person. What if I can't stand them or just like the chemistry is not good? Can you like put in a request for um, a partner in a Williams tutorial or is it always just up to the professor and assigned? 
Yeah, so from my understanding, uh, having taken a tutorial, having friends in tutorials and such, um, you normally uh, won't be able to request uh, a partner unless you have specific certain like specific circumstances. Uh, in my case, I didn't necessarily request a specific person, but because I was originally the only first year in my tutorial, uh, my professor was saying, you know, would you prefer having another first year student? If we had one that joined the class, would you like to be paired up with them? And I said, yeah. So um, within my class of 12 people that was paired off in groups, we were the only group that was made up of first year students. And in that kind of way, you know, they can be accommodating, but they would ideally want to give you a partner that's someone that you don't know, purely because, you know, I think they'd rather have you work with someone whose um, work style you might not recognize as well, someone you might have to like try a little bit harder to kind of understand, but for a good purpose. Again, the point of the tutorials is just to develop your writing and like to learn from your partner. So having this, uh, like combination of uh, work styles and sort of perspectives regarding the work that you're doing in these um, tutorials, definitely beneficial if it's someone that you don't know in many cases. Awesome, thank you, Lito. Um, so I'm gonna kind of merge a couple of questions together here um, and just kind of to like talk about our student body a little bit. So, um, you know, I showed you that map at the beginning and you know, some of it was just pointing at sort of, um, where our students are coming from geographically, but um, you know this this is a really um, diverse school. I think there are about forty two languages um, spoken on campus. Um, no, that was completely wrong. Religious tradition. Sorry, um, I think it's around seventy to eighty languages spoken on campus. Um, Nine percent of our students are international students. Um, over forty percent. Um, are declaring themselves U.S. students of, of color. Um, and so, you know, this place is exciting in that way because it is so diverse. Um, but then again, you know, some people ask us, okay, well, you know, is, is it really a place that's welcoming to all students and like who's happy at Williams? Um, you know, Lita, I'm wondering um, what your take has been as, as we've wrestled with diversity like so many colleges have and um, how you found maybe, um, you know, friendship and camaraderie at Williams. Yeah, I think it was definitely a new environment for me. Um, the area in Los Angeles that I come from, predominantly Latinx. So that was what I was used to both socially and academically. Coming here was a bit of a culture shift um, as it is just for many people in general, for whatever reason it may be. Uh, in my case, thankfully, so there are a lot of organizations, communities here on campus that are, have already been established and kind of want to do this work of, you know, creating community spaces. We actually have um, a center for that, the Davis Center, which is the multicultural center here on campus, which also hosts the Minority Coalition, which is the uh, coalition just of all the identity organizations here on campus, the student-led ones. So there's already a lot of support put into allowing students to both have um, a space and a means to, to create these opportunities for community development. So thankfully for me, it didn't take me too long to finally become part of these organizations, feeling very comfortable there. But I'm thinking in my experience as like a student of color, not necessarily through the association with those organizations, I still like really have enjoyed my time here. Like I think I've gained a lot from being here in many different ways, many people from many different perspectives. And I think we like do uh, really well at addressing any issues that do come up from time to time, because as any other school will, Williams also, you know, has its own fair share of issues. Uh, we have not been, you know, like, we, we have been targets like any other school for like these sorts of attacks, obviously, that don't happen that frequently, but when they do, the school is really good at responding to them. The student body, especially uh, within the past couple of years, has become more vocal about responding to these things, and as a result, there's just like quick movement from everyone involved in like addressing a lot of these issues. So um, very much like positive experience, like being in a place where people very much care and want to see this place be better. So they find ways to just address these things as effectively as possible. Lito, thank you. And thank you for sharing your, you know, your experiences as a student of color here at Williams. Thank you. Um, 
So let me talk a little bit about, um, I talked about grants and how, you know, financial aid packages here. Um, so someone's asking whether we give out any merit-based scholarships. We, we don't give out scholarships at all um, because like I said, most of our um, aid now is, is in the, well, all of it is in the form of grants. Um, so there are no loans. We're not gonna give any, you know, scholarship based on your GPA or anything. Um, and we are need blind for domestic students, but still um, need aware for international students, but there are no separate requirements, no special rules for applying as an international student. Um, and most of our international students are actually are on financial aid, um, but we are still sort of need aware for international students. Um, but yes, they get the same all grant package. Um, and I also wanna mention um, undocumented students or DACA students are also eligible for financial aid at Williams. Um, again, because we're not packaging in any federal loans or anything. Um, so yes, um, we do have undocumented students here and they are absolutely allowed um, to receive financial aid from us. Um, so Lito, let's see, I think we might have time for two more. Can you talk a little bit about like academic pressure at Williams, right? Uh, uh, there's no way <laughs> that um, there is not a Williams student, you know, who's been stressed out here, right? Um, but I'm wondering if you can talk really, really honestly just about like the academic sort of workload and, and what you might see as pressure here. Yeah, so they're very true. Um, there isn't a time when a student isn't feeling at least a little bit overwhelmed with work. Not that it's super common, but it'll happen, you know, midterms happen throughout the year, um, finals also. So there's definitely stressful periods that exist. Um, in regards to the academic pressure in general, the way that you can imagine it is we actually have a, a ratio for that that we like to work with. So for every hour of class that you're meeting, you're expected to do around three hours of work for it. So think of it that way. And each class, um, meets for about two and a half per week, two and a half up to three, depending. So um, imagine out of that, you're doing around six to eight hours per week, depending on the class per class. So it is like you're spending a lot of your time doing work. Um, in terms of, you know, whether it's difficult in that sense, um, like I mentioned earlier, very supportive academic environment. There's actually a lot of collaboration that's either encouraged by the professors or, you know, within the class, you'll find a group of people who are very invested in helping each other, like, work together. You know, if you have issues with, like, this uh, problem set or you want to do the readings and get different interpretations from people, there's a lot of just getting together and doing that. Like, that is very common. I mentioned there's a lot of support systems, be it the writing workshop, the math and science resource center, the econ resource center. Um, there's just many people that are out there also able to help. So despite the fact that, you know, the way that it often feels overwhelming is just due to the amount of work that you have to do, but it's not, it's, it's not that it's necessarily hard. It just, you know, it means you have to dedicate a little bit more time to figuring these things out. But in the end, you know, we don't want people to just go to a class because they feel like they're going to struggle and um, maybe learn a thing or two. No, we, we want it to be challenging. Of course, it's it's a rigorous environment in many ways. But at that time, um, we also just want it to be accessible. We want it to not be overly difficult to the point where you're not learning anything and you're just memorizing. I think that's the one thing you stop doing as a high, as a college student as opposed to high school, because in high school, very often you can get away with memorizing something, taking a test, and then you forget it forever. We want you to actually keep that information because it's very important and it'll help you out later in the future. So definitely not stressful in that way that people are fighting each other. It's more so it's very collaborative and people are working together to kind of make it as not um, like as not stressful as it could be. Thank you. I really I even if that's not on a student's mind in high school, I'm really glad you walked people through that. Um, yeah, it's it's important to know about sort of the you know academic culture at schools you're looking at. Um, so I'm going to wrap wrap up with asking Lito about sort of extracurricular stuff here at Williams, um, especially the small liberal arts college. You are just, you are going to spend a bunch of your time um, over the few years, I think, in some kind of club organization. At least that's how we roll at Williams. Students are definitely um, very involved in these. It's a big deal. Yes, you can create a new one. Um, so Lito, maybe, you know, could you mention, um, just some examples of, of organizations. Um, and then, like I said, sort of how important they are as a, as a, as a school, school culture. 
Yeah, so I can actually start off by talking about our biggest one, which is the Williams Outing Club. Um, if you've seen pictures of the school, you're looking at one right now, very pretty. Uh, it's very conducive to the school being very outdoorsy. So the Outing Club is very much there for that. Um, it is the biggest group on campus. There is technically a membership fee to join. It's around $10, but you get access to all of their things. You know, they have a, a, a huge equipment room. So if you need to borrow anything, you're able to borrow from there. There's cabins around the area that you can actually use and have access to for a, a day, for a weekend. If you and a couple of friends want to take trips and you have the membership, you're able to do that. Or around, for example, like wintertime, um, they do ski lessons here and there and they want to have students, you know, come over, try it for the first time, potentially, you know, keep doing it. But um, they do a lot of that kind of work and a lot of uh, many, just many things throughout the year. Um, there's a lot of identity groups as part of the Davis Center and the Minority Coalition. Um, there's a, a lot of groups that have been here for a long time and have huge memberships as a result, I'm thinking the Black Student Union, Vista, um, religious community is also huge. So no, every single group that exists, you know, has a, a relatively big following because you, when you're also applying to make a new club, I'm, I'm thinking of newer clubs right now, um, if you get it approved by Campus Life, you get access to funding, you get access to spaces to do either a practice or whatever you need for a meeting space, whatever you're thinking of making a club about. Uh, but there's a lot of freedom to go about this. You know, it's not that hard to register a club. And with the funding that you have, you know, you use it for the people that are already interested. And then you can put part of it also towards getting more people to be, um, to get into it. Uh, for example, in my case, I'm a fan of video games. I started a video game club for a while. And that went pretty well. Um, and it, all it took was just me saying like, hey, I have a group of people who would be interested in having, you know, like a weekly space to do this. So would we be able to have funding to buy things so people can play? And then also, can we have rooms on campus to just do this? And no, they've been very nice about it every single time. So I definitely recommend if you're interested in creating a new extracurricular, you obviously should go for it, at least try. Um, but otherwise, there's already over a hundred something um, organizations already registered as part of the campus and it keeps growing every year. Yeah, it is. Again, Alita, I appreciate the examples because it really, I mean, the range is incredible. For a few years here, we had a hot sauce club. Um, I know for many decades now we've had a financial consulting club, right? So you can see just an awesome range. Um, so yeah, and again, a testament to our, our students being super curious and really, really engaged. Um, so it's fun to, to look at the the list. Um, so we are about out of time and um, I, I apologize for my kind of froggy voice throughout this whole thing. Um, I don't think I've done this in, in a long time. And so um, thanks for listening um, so much to us. And again, hope that we sort of painted a, a picture of what life is like here at Williams academically and socially. Um, but as I said, uh, the, the admission um, email account is there. We'd love to hear from you um, and the Williams admission Instagram. Um, tag name is the is that what it, handle. Thank you. Um, the handle is there. So you could check that out. Um, Lito, thank you so much. I'm sure I will see you tomorrow in the office. Um, of and thanks so much to all of you out there again, who carved out time to, to come and, um, and listen to us. Have a great rest of your day or night. <laughs> Bye everyone.